think I'd be making a video when I left the house today. I was just uh, sitting down there watching uh, a live performance of the uh, Rackin Tours with Jack White and all those guys. And I had this urge to get in my car. And I just wanted to go out, maybe go to Walmart, pick up some supplies, but really it was just an excuse to get in my car. I wanted to drive the thing. I've had my Challenger now for just over a year. It's uh, coming toward the end. Yeah, it's at the very end now of September 2019. And I bought it at the end of August. 2018. So I had a year and a month now. There's been some repairs. Believe it or not, this car has uh, had major incidents with the engine cooling system. Three times now. Various parts failing. I can't remember exactly what happened first, but it, the symptoms are almost always the same. It's like the uh, heating and air conditioning. I notice that it's not working quite right. You know, it's not blowing cold air, or it's not getting hot enough. When it is cold out, I want it to warm up. That's the first time I. That's the first moment I noticed that something's going on. Is uh, my air conditioning is not quite doing what it's supposed to. But that is just a prelude to noticing that the engine temp is uh, fluctuating in weird ways or not heating up when it's supposed to be heating up or in some cases overheating. So the first time it happened it was the um, thermostat, I believe it was. It was a bad thermostat. Simple enough repair. Still it costs hundred dollars to diagnose that but still simple enough repair and I was good for a few months everything went back to normal but really only like three months later the symptoms start happening again my I noticed that uh, my uh, air conditioning heater wasn't really getting hot or it'd take a long time to get hot and then I would notice my uh, temperature gauge a few days later, acting up, and then I would take it in, and there'd be it was the um, a different problem. It wasn't a bad thermostat again. I've understood that thermostats can go bad really quickly. They're a pretty cheap part sometimes, but it wasn't the thermostat this time. It was like the uh, the water pump. Yeah, it was the uh, the the water pump in the engine cooler system. So that's, that was the second part failure involved with the engine cooling system. They replaced that. That was expensive. And those symptoms all went away for another three, maybe four months. Then I started to notice the exact same symptoms again, where uh, I was like, oh, wait a minute, is, this, is, is it taking a little too long for the uh, heater to get hot? Or um, how about in hot weather, when I want it to get cool, it's not quite staying cool like it should, you know? That was, that's always the first sign of something. Uh, my engine light goes on and I see that it's a temp warning and then I look at the temp and it's in the red as far as it can go I'm like oh Jesus Christ did I just destroy my car so I uh, pull over to the side in heavy traffic turn the car off pop the hood I hear some you know sizzling and steam but nothing's like billowing out of the engine and uh, I don't really know much about engines, I don't know how to fix things, so I didn't really touch anything, I just looked at it to see that it wasn't smoking or burning, and there was no smell of burning. So I'm, I 
close everything down and get back in my car and I just sit there on the side of the road thinking, okay, am I going to be calling a tow truck? Uh, what, what are my options? And a few minutes later, I mean really just three minutes, I go, well, maybe I'll just try and creep home because I don't want to be doing this here on the side of the highway in such heavy traffic at rush hour. So I turn my engine back on and this time the uh, engine temp is, it, it, was, it, was, it was way up high, but by this time it had gone down just a little bit. But now, as the engine was running, it was falling down like it should. It was basically, it had kicked the system back into gear and the coolant was working again. And sure enough, it went back down to the ideal operating temperature, like midpoint, and stayed there. I drove home and stayed there. but. I was freaked out by that, obviously. I don't ever want that happening again, so scheduled an appointment with the mechanic. Went to the mechanic the next day, had to call off work. And I'm thinking, okay, is it the thermostat again? Is it the water pump again? What the fuck is it? Remember, this is only like three or four months after they replaced my water pump. They run a diagnostic, they try to do some tests, they... Uh, do some stress tests to make sure there's no leaking anywhere, that the, everything's connected good. And everything was good except they found that the coolant was low. Now, your coolant shouldn't be low after just a few months of use if there's no leaking. So it sounds to me like when they replaced the water pump, they didn't fill up the coolant as far as they should have. And yet this still cost me there's no way to really prove that anyways uh but it was just low coolant most likely some bubbles in it due to low coolant causing the whole thing to freak out so they replenished the coolant and everything went back to normal three failures all involving the uh cooling system of the engine that's weird that's fucked up that <laughs> i don't even know how to explain that you know, it's like, is there just a gremlin in this system that loves to destroy the cooling system? Or is this a normal Hemi thing? I don't know. But within my first year, I've had it fail three times. Three different aspects of it um, causing me problems. Now that might sound like I'm complaining. That I'm like, don't buy this car. It's terrible. This is a 2010, so it's an older model. I've had it now for... A year, uh, if, if I can remember correctly, I got it with 38,000 miles on it. And in that year, I'm now up to uh, 57, 57K. So this is my daily driver. I have a decent commute to and from work every day. It racks those things up. This car has gone through a lot. And I drive it like a maniac. You know, I very regularly floor it from a dead stop. I very regularly downshift, even though it's an automatic, I like to manually downshift, get some power going. I drive it like a muscle car should be driven. And apart from the cooling system, this car has been a joy. You know, it, you just maintain it. You make sure that there's good fluids in there, that there's oil. Take it into the shop as often as you can, just for, you know, normal maintenance stuff. And my Hemi, which is now quite old, uh, just, it just works. It's beautiful. I've enjoyed the hell out of this car. However, <laughs> there's, uh, things have happened to the car. What was it, um... Oh yeah, pretty much my my anniversary with it, late August, just last month. What was, oh, so yeah, this was actually the last time the cooling system failed. I was at my mechanics, they uh, diagnosed it, they, this is low coolant, they replaced it, everything was good, and I'm driving home from the, <laughs> from the mechanics. And on the highway, the 
this truck with a bed, you know, a trailer bed full of tree cuttings. He's dropping crap behind him. And I'm not behind him, I'm over, I'm over a ways, but I'll show you the video. He's dropping crap behind him, and a log rolls out across a lane. The car in front of me drives over it, and his back tire flips the log up, and it embeds in my engine bay destroying three panels of the car. You know, the uh, the hood need to be replaced, the uh, cowl, you know, the front bumper, which covers the entire front of the car, including the lights, that whole cowl part need to be replaced, and the driver's side fender. There's a tiny, tiny little area that got a little bent by the log. So it's like this corner piece of three pieces that the log stuck into and need to be replaced. Now, the second that happened, you'll see in the video, I was upset, but I was thinking, okay, I've got to make sure I get that truck to pull over. I need his insurance, because I'm not fucking paying for this. So I sped up, got in front of him, slowed down in front of him and had my window down. I was like, pull over, pull over. And so we get to an off ramp. We both pull over. And it was actually a woman driving with maybe her husband in the passenger seat. Um, but he, he just sort of let her handle the whole thing, which is interesting. And so she was, uh, she was apologetic. First of all, she gets out of the car because she sees me taking pictures of the front of my car. So she's like, what kind of damage I'm looking at? She sees a log from her trailer bed stuck in my car. And she's like, oh my God. <laughs> So she, she knew there was no, you know, oh, it's not as bad as that. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, so she gave me the insurance. She admitted fault to my face. Um, but I'm thinking I've heard stories, enough stories to know that uh, too, too many people will say, oh, yes, it was my fault to your face. But when it's time to talk to the, the insurance, they have another story to tell. So I'm, I just sort of let them know. I said, you know, you guys seem like honest folk, but... Just so you know, I have a dash cam that recorded the whole thing. You know, I've got the uh, OWL car cam system. So let's stay honest this entire time because any story that you tell, I've got proof of what happened. And uh, <laughs> and they were all just like, oh yeah, I understand. But I think that, well, I can't say, I don't want to pretend like they would have lied otherwise, but doing that at least played a part in making sure that this process ran smoothly because when I later that day I was calling their insurance um, make, establishing a claim they then called the owners of the insurance um, the owner of the truck and I was just waiting to hear back from that and they then called me within you know 20 30 minutes They're like they verified everything we are taking full responsibility we're gonna pay for everything and it was a very, very chaotic evening. Um, a lot of calls, a lot of trying to race from point A to point B to get my car taken care of. Um, but at the very least, I had this weight lift on my shoulders going, whatever happens, my car is going to be taken care of, and it's not going to cost me anything. My insurance is not going to uh, raise its rates on me because it's not a... It's, I'm not at fault, and they're not having to pay for anything. It was all State Farm uh, was the other guy's insurance, and they took care of everything. Their system was really nice. I was able to call them multiple times throughout this whole process as I was waiting for things and trying to get information, and they always answered. They always were willing to uh, do the legwork to work with the rental agency to work with a collision system, the collision repair shop, which I used uh, a cable donor collision repair shop. I, I go to a cable dumber Kia for my normal maintenance and service, 
because that was the shop that I bought my car from and I've been really impressed with their facility. They've always known how to handle my car. They've always done a good job. So I, I continue to go there. Um, they like me, I like them. So I, when I went back to that shop going, what cable, uh, what collision repair, or I basically, I went back that very day going, look at what happened to my car as I left your shop. Um, you guys have a, you guys have a body repair shop. Uh, I saw a big poster in the waiting room as I was sitting there having you look at my cooling system. You guys do collision repair. And they're like, but well, we don't. <laughs> the cable Dahmer does, which is a large chain, but that location does not. They're like, well, you go to Cable Dahmer Buick up in Independence and uh, they'll take care of you. There was a lot more complication to it than that, but the main thing is it all worked out. I got there, things were working out, I was able to get a rental car, and State Farm took care of everything. My, uh, it took 23 days, though, for everything to work out. Now, those 23 days were not all business days, and there was a wasted few days at the beginning due to some confusion over who was supposed to do the estimate on my damages, and then there was a holiday involved with all that. So it took almost a week before somebody could actually even look at my car and sign a check saying, okay, let's do these repairs. But since I didn't have to pay for anything, you know, I was pretty patient with the whole thing. And the work they did was beautiful. I'll show you a picture. Actually, I'll, show, I'll probably show you a video. Yeah, I'll take a video for you guys. Yeah, the repairs were done. I don't have my stripes on yet. Uh, the, the paint and the clear coat needs to cure, they said, for about a month before they want to put vinyl back on there. And I'm seriously thinking about uh, putting a different vinyl decal on. Probably some racing stripes down the center of the hood. I found one online with uh, the RT logo in the middle of these two stripes. That's pretty badass. I'm going to call my collision guys up and say, you're already paid for putting the stripes back on. If I provided you with different decals, could you do those instead? I suspect they will, but we'll see. Either way, my car is kind of naked right now. Kind of. Just those stripes right there. They got everything else done in it. It looks really good. And after 23 days of driving a rental from Hertz, a Ford Fiesta, I hate that car so much. After 23 days of driving that piece of shit, I've now had my Challenger back for a week, and it feels great. Which is one of the reasons why I came out here today, to drive, just to drive. It just feels good to have my car back. My baby. The Ford Fiesta. Aside from it being more than three times weaker than my car. Like, the Ford Fiesta has 120 horsepower. My Challenger has 375. So that's over three times more horsepower than that Fiesta. Apart from that, which was a very noticeable problem, just the size of the Fiesta. I was, it was uncomfortable always, at all times. Just, I felt trapped. My legs were always in awkward positions. I readjusted the seats and the steering wheel 50 times thinking there's got to be a, a perfect balance where it's not terrible. But no, that's a terrible car. That's a terrible, shitty piece of fucking crap. And I don't wish it on anybody. And I definitely had a problem with how weak it was, but that was expected after driving something like this. Oh, but so I have my car back, and here I am a year into it, loving it still. There's been some ups and downs, no doubt. But it's been a delight. I mean, not the ups and downs, but it, owning has been a delight. I love this car. I have no intention of going back to really any other kind of car. I think I, I, think I want to keep a Challenger forever. Yeah. Finally! What? I've seen you every single day and I'm like, let me get close, let me get close. 
<laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> This is people at my work. They nicknamed me Speedy back when I was just driving Honda Civics. That's I just drove fast. Uh, they noticed that, I and mean, people in my work they noticed that I was a bit of a speed demon. So they nicknamed me Speedy. Then when I got a Challenger, it just made sense to them. Like they just saw me in it, and they go, "You know that, that thing just fits you." You drive it like you should. You scare us all half to death, but it really fits you. It suits you. You're speedy for real now. And when they saw me in the Ford Fiesta for weeks, <laughs> uh, one time my uh, coworker he pulled up to me at a stoplight. He took his phone out and just smiled at me. He took a picture and he goes, "You look so awkward in that thing. You know that thing does not fit you at all." And I couldn't help but smile and agree. Uh, a challenger fits me. It's not just my opinion. It's people see me and they go, you belong in that car. You know, it fits you like a glove. The big, powerful thing. You're not a big, powerful man. I mean, I'm overweight, but I'm not powerful. But it's my mentality, you know. It just suits me. Challenger is my baby. And I am its master or mistress. <laughs> now, I think I'm going to include in this video some discussion of a year of owning it in terms of seasons. I live in the Midwest, so I see the full season cycle. We get the snow, we get the ice, we get the crazy rain, we get the beautiful summers. We see it all. And I don't have another car. This is my daily driver. This is my only car. So when it's time to go to work, it doesn't really matter what the roads are like. I've got to take this thing out in it. And I did. We had some crazy winter last winter. Um, I don't look forward to that again. But I'm sure we'll have it. Ice. You know, this car... I took it on black ice, you know, I took it in snow, and people will tell you that powerful rear wheel drive vehicles are absolutely terrible or undrivable in snow and ice and bad weather, and they're wrong. Um, there are conditions where any car can get stuck, um, but I was able to get through it and there was there was some luck involved because there was some really hairy moments I'll show a video don't stop don't stop
not even touched. Not even of when I passed, I, it was like a terrible situation, but there was a, a Camaro stuck on the side of the road, and there was another car stuck on the side of the road, and I was really close to being stuck in that same area. I was able to get through it. Uh, that was more luck than anything else, and, it, and the car in front of me almost destroyed my chance of getting through it. You'll see that also. I remember, <laughs> I, I created that video a while ago, ago but I remember saying something about, oh, you goddamn bastard. You kind of slowed down and stopped at the worst possible moment. So my momentum of getting through it was compromised, and yet I was still able to get up a, a hill of just nasty snow. And at work also, I don't have a video of this, but at work, uh, I had to get up. It's a big hill um, in the parking lot. <laughs> And I leave for lunch. I leave for lunch. It's starting to snow. It's kind of nasty. I do my lunch. I come back and getting back up that hill. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, it was insane. I was basically just spinning my tires, slowly inching up this hill, thinking really seriously that I might not actually be able to make it up this thing. And yet I did. So, but before you go, see, you shouldn't have had a rear wheel, rear, rear, rear wheel drive car. I made it up that hill, and my coworker, who was in a front wheel Ford, um, oh, what, what was it? A Ford, not a Taurus. It's like the middle size vehicle, a hybrid, not hybrid. You know, you know what I'm talking about. It's one of those sedan, Ford sedans. And he couldn't make it up. I made it up, he did not make it up. So it's not so much huh, the real, real stuff. It's just a little bit of luck and uh, determination. But you can drive this thing in any, in any kind of weather. There was moments when it was on pure ice, just black ice. And it was scary. But you just slow down. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. Just slow the fuck down, you know. Don't uh, don't accelerate fast if you're on dangerous conditions. Just slow down, and take it easy, and you should be fine. There's no guarantee that you'll be fine, but that's kind of how you drive any car. This a muscle car is no real different in that situation. You just drive appropriately for the conditions. And I was able to make it through a terrible, terrible winter of all kinds of weird snow and ice. And I'm looking for another one this year. <laughs> Not forward, I'm looking forward. I'm scared. <laughs> but it was, it was okay the first year. So yeah, that's a year of owning a Challenger. 2010 Red Challenger. RT V8. It works as a daily driver, even in places that aren't the West Coast. The 
midst of all of its treachery. This works as a daily driver. So don't be overly afraid of it. You can manage. In the worst possible cases, you might have to call in sick. Or call it, you know, say the roads are too much. That does happen. That happens whether you're driving, you know, anything that isn't a four-wheel drive beast. Um, that's not so much a muscle car thing. It's just a, a small car thing. Some conditions are too much to drive and you just don't even try. But snow in general isn't that. It's basically if it's plowed. If it's plowed, you're safe. If it's unplowed, you shouldn't be trying anyways. Unless you have a plow in front of your car. <laughs> so yeah. It's doable. It's doable like any car is. If you're used to sedans, a Challenger can do all of that. If you're used to four-wheel drive trucks, that's going to be the better solution in the most extreme cases. Um, but as a, just a car... A daily driver, this suits all conditions. And I don't want anything else. Thanks for watching. Bye.